Welcome to the Pure Performance Cafe. May I take your order? Yes, I would like a shot of Pure Performance, please. Coming right up. Hello and welcome to the Pure Performance Cafe. My name is Brian Wilson and we have a little bit of a change for you all today. Uh, A lot of you follow the Pure Performance Cafe and uh, we talk to um, different members of the Dynatrace community. Uh, We're going to start what will hopefully be now a little bit more of a regular show for the cafe uh, hosted up by my guest today who will then be taking over for this aspect of it. I'd like to introduce you all to James Kitson. James, hello. Hello, how's it going? Good. And uh, James, you are a member of the Dynatrace uh, Expert Services team, correct? You're a guardian currently? Yep, that's correct. All right, so everyone listening, what James is going to do, James is bringing us uh, right now, today, we'll call it Tales from the Trenches, Dynatrace Tales from the Trenches. Uh, Maybe that name will change in the upcoming weeks, who knows, but that's what we're going with for now. Basic idea is we want to bring you all stories of real-world samples of how people have used Dynatrace to find some issues, and possibly if we can get some lessons learned on how they might have been able to avoid that in the first place. Um, So today, I will be starting out talking to James about this. But in the future, I'd like to get you all to give a warm, pure performance welcome because James will be taking over this aspect of the Tales from the Trenches from here on out. No, no pressure, James, but <laughs> congratulations on getting a, a show with us and see people perseverance. Perseverance pays off. So anyhow, James, what do you have for us this week? So we just had a, a quick story um, from an experience I had working with one of our customers. Um, and this relates to um, Dynatrace Atmon. Um, our older product, but it's still the actual like uh, process we went through to find this issue and deal with it sort of would be the same um, in Dynatrace now. Um, so essentially what happened was we got contacted by a um, team who was testing one of their applications and they found that underneath a load test, it was actually, they were getting a ton of um, out of memory errors on their application. And it was sort of unusual on that it seemed to be sort of like a randomly selected server would just suddenly spike in memory usage. It mm-hmm. wasn't like a gradual ramp up. Right. Um, and so it was sort of difficult to figure out exactly what had changed that was leading to that. Okay. So, yep. Yep. And so that's ha- sort of the start. Yeah. How, how long into the test would this happen? Was this like during the ramp up or the initial load or is this like a, as the, as the, the load was running for a while? So it definitely seemed that it was after um, it had a, a significant amount of load on it, but it didn't seem like it was tied directly to sort of gradually increasing with the load or anything like that. All right. So so basically, and I'm, I'm putting my, my, my old load tester hat on here, you ramp up a load, a test is running, and at some point during the middle of running this test, uh, you have a, you're getting out of memory issues or huge increases of memory consumption. So it was probably steady state load at this point is what we're looking at. Um, so what did you guys and gals do? How did you figure out what was going on here and what what was the cause of this issue? Obviously, I mean, I can't I know the real answer, so I can't pretend to guess. Um, but let's just <laughs> let the, the the listeners off the hook. So generally, when it's like a huge spike like that, I sort of figure it's not directly related to like the load like there's not like a memory leak or something otherwise it'd be more of a gradual increase um so typically what i would do in that situation is try and filter down to this one of the servers that was having the issue in one of our um one of the like the recorded histories in one of our tests one of the sessions mm-hmm. and just sort of see what was going on in that server if there's anything stood out that was unusual in the transactions it was seeing right. um, so what we did was we filtered down to like right down to like the minute of when the, the memory spiked up um, filtered to the specific server that we saw the issue on. Um, and then there was this strange transaction we could see. Um, it wasn't like the rest of the month. It wasn't part of like the test um, that was running or anything. And this, it had a huge um, response time, like a duration. And it was right at the exact same time when that memory um, spiked up. Uh-huh. So we showed that to some of the developers we were sitting at the table with. And then that really got them thinking. And they realized that it was related to a job a scheduled job that would occur, basically, it was it was related to load, so like a certain number of amounts of load would kick it off. Okay. But I think it was like in general, it was like pulling like customer records or something. Um, but what was interesting was um, this wasn't something that was technically new. Like it wasn't that they didn't actually like add it. It was something that had been broken in the past. And during one of the releases in between since the last load test, they had actually um, tried to fix that. And so when it actually tried to run, so it successfully was trying to run, but it actually introduced this new issue into the test. 
Right, so this is a situation then where, uh, and, and and I believe we talked earlier, this is not necessarily a batch job, right? Because this was picked up automatically, um, right? So as anybody who uses uh, Atmon or Dynatrace knows, um, certain transactions or most transactions we pick up automatically. But if it's like a cron job or some kind of batch job, you could do a custom service or custom entry point, pick those up. Uh, this one was actually picked up automatically. Uh, so that's why you're able to see it. And... It's this runs, as you're saying, after a certain amount of load, there's got to do some kind of cleanup work or something else. And then it was the transaction ran. Um, and you, we had discussed something before this, right? So you were able to look at the transaction. Uh, but before you were, they were looking into the data with Dynatrace, what was their first reaction? What were they so, going to do first, yep. right? You, you told me this crazy idea. I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so... It had been a number of releases since they did their last load test, and so it wasn't exactly clear where they introduced what, which one introduced the issue. So the plan, and this was essentially like it was around a time of the year when a bunch of people people were taking vacation, but the plan was to manually go through all of those um, changes that had been implemented, every single one of them, and just try and figure out which ones might possibly have introduced the issue. So it essentially would have been an entire week by like a handful of developers just looking through and trying to figure out what could be the issue before they could even try and fix it. Yeah, and, and that's the old world I used to live in before we had <laughs> Atmon where we would have an issue and it'd be like, well, we think it might be these things. Why don't you run a special test on these components? And, and you know, the funny thing is sometimes the developers actually see an issue in the code that they were reviewing, not even knowing if that was what caused it, but they would mm -hmm. see, oh, there's an issue here. Before you run a test, we're going to fix that code, <laughs> right? So they would make fixes yep, to yep. something that, yeah, but it, Probably was better to fix in the first place, but they didn't even know if that was it. You know, of course, you'd go through all these iterations of testing and testing and it not finding it. So in this case, you all were lucky enough to find a pure path or a transaction that triggered it. And that, I guess, reduced. Yeah, I mean, greatly reduced the issue. Um, so any 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 before I go to the, you know, at least before we go to talking into how this could have been prevented, any any other things to tell about uh, this issue at all or is that the basically the story uh i'd say that's 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 pretty much the sum of it yeah okay um so you know obviously in my mind you know, what andy and i talk about a lot um ways to prevent this right let's 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 talk to the to our listeners about some some best practices um now one of the issues that the funniest part about this whole story that you mentioned was that this function was there all the time but it didn't work. And during yes. some release at some point, they fixed it. Right. And that to me, the first thing that screams out to me is, well, why wasn't that code change and that fix of a transaction announced to the testing team as part of the release so that they would be on the lookout for testing that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. correct. Because like even um, you may not want to do like a full load test for absolutely every single change that you make, but it mm -hmm. sounded like it was something directly tied to how much activity was occurring. So you definitely think that'd be a, a call for a quick load test right after that was introduced. Right. And, and to the point I was making, uh, at another time when we were discussing this, um, you know, in, in a best practice shop, right. The development team would have a unit test for this code mm -hmm. and they would test it cause they would probably want to know that it works. Um, and again, best practice would be, Hey, if we're running new tests for functions that are going to work, we should pass on those tests to the team. But obviously, as you mentioned, this wouldn't, this only occurred under load. So the development team might not catch anything, but that is specifically the case where the development team, you know, the whole idea of co a collaboration in the whole DevOps mind of things is if the testing team is working closely with the development team, and telling the development or helping teach the developers how to do their own testing, what kind of things to look out for, as well as, you know, developers helping teach testers how to do certain kinds of codes and programming and automation. Um, in that situation, your developers might say, oh, yeah, we run a unit test, but we know this thing functions a lot heavier under load. So we're automatically going to flag this build as requiring load testing, you know, making it so that that's part of the release process right is that this piece needs a higher load test to it um and they could even have shared the same test that they 
you know, if, if it even needed a specific test, obviously it's going to run on its own. Uh, the the testing team would just have to observe it and make sure everything's looking good. Um, any 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 thoughts on your side for? No, yeah, absolutely. Like the whole, the whole concept of like sharing information, and even um, one of the reasons that the the dev team was thinking they would have to manually sort of review this to start with is they weren't completely aware of all the information that we were collecting to start with. Yeah. So I'm just knowing like what you have available to sort of troubleshoot these issues also helps as well. Yeah. I mean, this is a very common kind of story in a much more waterfall minded. I, I mean, I want to say waterfall, not necessarily waterfall, but the older mind, older minded style of releases where there's not the communication between the two t- teams. It's the toss over the fence to see what happens. Uh, the fact that a feature that runs a job like that gets fixed and no one from the testing side uh, was necessarily aware of it to be on the lookout for it uh, just, you know, screams old style, you know, and that's what we're all looking to uh, avoid. So, yes, uh, it's great that they had Atmon to find the problem, but even better would have been to have knowledge of it in the, in the first place and would have been best to have the development team even possibly set up when they do their unit test on that um, unit or the piece enough records that it would run that job properly. And obviously they could use the tools uh, on that level to help them gather statistics about how many queries and if it's a good architecture and all that. Um, Anyway, excellent. I think that's uh, any, any last thoughts on this from you at all? Actually one quick thing, because I just remembered it while we were talking there is, one of the other uh, thoughts they had for resolving the issue was the um, research we have that would actually write the tests. They were thinking about writing basically t- a ton of new tests that each one would simply be taking out one of the features that they had just so they could sort of narrow it down to what part of the, the application, one of the, which feature oh, was actually geez. sort of related to that. And that would have been, that probably would have been like at least a week or two of activity before they could find that. So Yeah, I've, I've, I've been there too. Um, so this, uh, you know, for everyone listening, please let that be that, that the prospect of encountering that alone should be a, enough to, to help you kickstart your way onto a new way of putting out code in the pipeline. And in fact, James, I'm going to share this now because we were just talking with, um, Donovan Brown of Microsoft, and that's going to air on, on pure performance, the, the main show, uh, on the 21st of May, um, there's this whole idea, you know, dev, you know, moving to a continuous pipeline, right? And it's people usually think it's this really, really big undertaking, which it is, uh, and they think they have to get permission to do it all. And a lot of times, even in the Dynatrace case, you know, we had permission, we had support, we had full blown everything in order to move to a what are we six month to two week release cycle. Um, the point that Donovan made is don't always ask for permission, because a lot of times you might be told no. Right. We got to just keep shipping stuff. His point was take 15 minutes of your day and work on a little piece of the pipeline. Right. No one's going to notice that 15 minutes and you're going to get benefit out of it. And you can slowly and steadily make some improvements that will then translate to every uh, team. And by at the end, suddenly you'll have this great example that everyone will say, oh, wow, you can do that. Hey, let's do that. And then everyone's going to jump on board. And my favorite part about the permission side was, and if you ask permission, you do it anyway, then you're being insubordinate. So just don't ask for permission at all. <laughs> anyway, check out that full podcast. That's going to be around the 21st. It's an awesome. Uh, Andy and I had a great time talking uh, talking to Donovan about that stuff. Um, well, James, thank you very much for, uh, for being on today. And I'm looking forward to you taking this over because obviously I talk too much. Uh, looking forward to you taking this over and uh, making it your own. And, and welcome to the Pure Performance family. We're glad to have you with us. Thank you.